and then we can get started with this birds meet session which is very exciting for us birds meet photography <laughs> Now, I am joined tonight by Luca Amorim. He is from, uh, he's actually the BirdLife Australia Photography Awards coordinator, um, and he is an incredibly accomplished wildlife photographer. Um, and tonight he'll be joining us to share the path he's had getting into where he is now and also some kind of tips and advice for anyone who might want to kind of walk that same path. The reason we wanted to have a birds meet photography session is that I know for a lot of people um, as you kind of develop this love for birds and nature you want to be able to capture it and capture those memories but there are definitely ways that that can be done in a more ethical and uh, safe way for birds and wildlife and I'm hoping tonight we can hear a little bit about that from Luca as well. So I will also just mention that if you want to join the Q&A, you can do that by the VBOX platform and I will put the URL in the chat. But there's also a, look at, can you see that QR code there? Yes, I can. Okay, there's also the QR code that you can scan if you need to, but I'll pop the URL in the chat as well. So I think that we have just about heard enough from me and I can pass it over to Luca to tell us all about what happens when birds meet photography. So be my guest. Thank you, Annie. Thank you for introducing me. And I'm absolutely honored that to be that to be here, you know, talk to you guys and give us give you guys a little bit of insight um, on like the ethical side of like for wildlife photography. Um, when when Annie first contacted me back in, I think early May, April, I think it was early April or March or something something like that. Very organized. I think it was May. Yeah. yeah, and I and one of the first things was I uh, the email, like, can you talk a little bit more about ethical photography, and that's a thing that I think all of us are really really passionate like about at um at BirdLife Photography, especially when you're running the BirdLife Australia Photography Awards, where we hammer on top of like, ethical photography is a big thing where we put bird safety um, above like the shot. So I kind of prepared a little bit today talking about uh, photo photographical solutions, because I think um, a, big, a big thing is when you're working as a wildlife photographer, you, you have to find solutions to problems right and it, it's it's photographer problems but you know it's what it's the difference between getting the shot and not getting the shot so i'll just quickly share my screen so um we can like we can segue into that so here we go all right so i brought you a little slide today just with some a couple of of different photos different techniques and like some different uh, ideas behind creating a photo with an eth like with an ethical uh, mindset in mind. So before we start, um, if you don't know me yet, uh, and he has talked a little bit about me, but I'm a conservation focused wildlife photographer. I've been the Australian Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year finalist last year, and I've been also Bird Photographer of the Year, uh, highly commended, and last year as well. Uh, prior to that, I've, I've won a couple of different awards throughout different competitions, and I'm a featured photographer across uh, some different magazines and uh, platforms as well. Um, but yeah, enough about me. Well, moving forward, it's it's pretty simple. The idea is what makes a wildlife image great, right? Um, so as a as many photographers have said before. You got to look at it from three perspectives. Uh, the first perspective is the image can be observed for a, lo a long time. So imagine yourself in any of these wildlife photography galleries. Um, I, I can guarantee you that you're going to stand in front of one or even any of them. And you're just going to be standing there for a long time. And you're going to be like, wow, how did they get this shot? 
And the second thing, which is really important in those factors, is that the picture messes messes around with the, the observer's feeling. So imagine yourself looking at one of these pictures and being either really happy, really joyful, uh, either really sad as well because something is wrong, like in, in nature, and, and you've just realized through the photographer's perspective. And another one is the photo is super hard to create again. So in all of those, in all of those, it's really important to uh, combine those three so you start to get an idea of what makes a, fo a photo really good. And this goes into perspective as well when you start to build on the process of making a photo. So you got to take all of these three uh, factors and put it into the process of making a photo. So we're going to break down the process today a little bit, and we're also going to talk about how the process works and in three different stages, right? So basically, whenever you're creating a photo, there's three processes. There's the pre-production, the production, and the post-production of a photo, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. All right, so let's start on pre-production. So pre-producing... Um, you're probably going to hear all of, like you've you most of you know a little bit about this already. It's about setting your subject, choosing the right equipment for the job, choosing the right time and place to do the job, and also most importantly, preparing your equipment before use. And it's it's interesting where uh, this comes to in in effect where where when we're talking about pre-producing, it's also preparing to interact with wildlife in a conscious way, right? Where we're not putting the wildlife at risk and we're also capturing something that's relevant to the shot. So um, whenever we, we talk about studying your subject, it's basically knowing ba basic species behavior. Um, so most of you would, would know your local birds. If you like, if you're already interacting with your backyard birds, you, you, you would see uh, what's surrounding you and what's their normal behavior. You would also know how to interact with these birds in a safe way that they're not getting uh, necessarily like injured by your actions or you're not uh, changing their actions by what you were doing. So a big, a big thing where I have we like we always hammer on to like whenever you're doing ethical bird photography and studying your subject is observe from afar. Try to keep your minimum, your distance at a very like, like keep your distance uh, as much as you can, and try to stay like far away from the bird as you can, and keep that bird wild as much as possible. So, um, knowing your basic species behavior can either be through a book, but you can also do it through observation, right? And it's like we also got to look at integrating success rates and how like how much money you're gonna spend on to uh, producing a piece of work, right? Uh, we also, like a big thing is field reconnaissance as well, where you gotta know where to find your animal in a safe way, where you're not gonna be interacting too much with the, with the habitat or the behavior of the bird, right? So right, let's look at how field reconnaissances work, especially um, when we're looking, when we're observ observing birds from from afar and trying to uh, understand what their behavior is, right? So our, when when we tackle we tackle the first bit of of studying your subject, right? Um, it always starts with field reconnaissance, I'd say. So the idea originates at the field, and then you got to think about what you want to photograph and how you're going to do it, right? Also, you got to think about how, when, and when will I what what like what do I want to photograph and when is this going to happen, right? Because uh, let's say you're photographing a emu in in like in this place where there is no emus, right? And like if you're if you're like if what you studied has not uh, necessarily combined with what like is actually happening, there's a big difference right there. Um, so I, I recommend highly whenever we're doing the pre-producing is basically look, go out there, create the idea and start to build on top of that, start to observe what's happening as well. And this is also when you can do a little bit of trail, trail camera research. So depending on uh, what you're doing or who you're with or if 
if you've got permits. I always recommend to have permits on that. Um, you can start to study your subject in a uh, in a citizen scientist way with permits and like with with different uh, clearances where you can use trail camera to uh, a trail camera to start to identify what's happening, where it's happening, and what type of species is causing that behavior as well. And visual visual research is a big thing where I would recommend to be out there in the bush with a pair of binoculars and identify what's going on. So when when we're talking about this, this is just the idea of you starting to build a concept and starting to uh, understand how the species work before you photograph it. Um, because as soon as you know how the species works, you all you also know what to do and what not to do. Um, like another part of pr producing is choosing the right equipment, right? And a big thing is that sometimes, uh, depending on what species you're going to photograph, you got to have the right the right species as well. Um, no, sorry, the right equipment because, like, depending on what you're going to photograph, you might not actually have the right gear. And when I say that, I'm, I mean spe especially if you're going to try to photograph a wild bird at a, like at a close range and you're going to uh, use a short lens for that, you're probably going to get too close. So that's not going to be good for the, for the bird. And it's also going to put a lot of stress on the bird. But it also helps you to uh, create a, uh, a, a narrative and spill the story around the, the species. So depending on what lens you use, it's going to build a better like a better representation of what you you want in in the overall image um i'll give a little bit of examples of, of that in the in in a few slides coming up as well and a big thing as well is choosing the right time and place to do the job so um basically it's knowing like minimizing your impact on on the habitat and knowing when to go in and, and do like do what you're supposed to do get as minimal interference with the habitat and the animal but get the shot and get out basically um again you want to keep the animal as wild as possible and minimize uh your like how much you're going to be there so a big thing as well when it comes to that is also identifying uh what's the best lights and what's the best start time for that? Because you also don't want to be there um, seven hours earlier and then like not get the shot and be there bothering the animal for seven hours, right? Um, and you also want to be like precise when if you want to capture a behavior, you got to be there at a specific time that you're hoping to capture that as well. Um, and then also a big thing is preparing your equipment because when it comes to uh, getting like getting the best shot and getting it with minimal interference, sometimes it's a good thing where if like it's a bad thing where if you're not prepared and you show up unprepared, you might take extra steps to to get something that is not uh, not going to happen or is going to happen, but you're taking too longer like too long to be there. So, uh, um. To exemplify that, it would be kind of like, let's suppose you show up with a missing battery and then you're fidget, fidgeting with that, trying to find a battery and not knowing where it is. And then you like all, you've stressed yourself already and you've uh, and that energy is flowing around a little bit. You, the, you're a little bit frantic and you're not like in a normal calm environment um, and you're putting that stress on the environment as well. So sometimes stuff like that can go a pretty long way when it comes to uh, photographing the species because you, you might be putting a special like pressure on the species uh, depending on how you're you're acting as well so preparing your equipment is goes a pretty long way when it comes to uh, like repres like actually going for a shoot it's not just for your own like mental health but also for the animal's physical health right um and then so that that's basically what goes into pre-producing um it's when pre-producing is more uh finding out when is the the best time to photograph it when it's the best like what species is being photographed what's the behavior how can you avoid that um and trying to find like finding the narrative 
And before you like going for the narrative, seeing what's the the minimum impact that you can do on a specific species. Um, and then when it comes to producing, producing is the next step of like the next natural way when when it comes to to stepping out there and getting the shot that you want to do. Produce like I th it's a good thing as well where if you've pre-produced and you've known the behavior that you want to photograph and the species that you want to photograph and how you want to photograph as well, it comes into mind where you start a a a problem starts to arise. Um, and then the photographer's job is to kind of try and solve that problem. And that the solving that problem comes through producing. So in a, in a nutshell, producing is overcoming challenges and finding unique perspectives, right? And I'll talk a little bit about this soon as well. It's also approaching your subject and using light to paint your picture. And all of these work very, very close together where um, they you have to work, like put all these three perspectives into producing into getting that best shot um when it, let's let's talk about the first item right there as well before we 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 keep going into the rest of the stuff so this is this is the bit the bit where i stress the most because this is where the 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 nitty gritty of ethical photography comes in because when when the idea has already originated and I think all of you have had the idea already where you already like you've already done the pre-producing and I I think most of you have already been out there observing birds working with birds and, and are, are completely involved with birds and have had the ideas where it's kind of like you've already done that first bit and you know what you're photographing you know like what time it's happening you know what's out there you've already had that that idea in your mind where you go it would be really cool if someone got this shot and i think that's where uh you've already you've already found the problem but this is where we find the solution and i think the biggest thing as well is when finding the solution that's when ethical photography kicks in because that's when you've got to worry about how you interact with the animal um let's let's look a little bit about uh, into how we overcome challenges and find unique perspectives right so I, I always put these uh these up because this is kind of like what everyone uses and everyone will use usually when it comes to photography and finding unique perspectives and when i say you finding unique perspectives is finding something that no one has ever, ever photographed and uh, photographed and trying to find something that's completely out of the box so for some people, it's it's finding it's getting that shot where an osprey is coming out of the water with a fish. Nobody has ever seen an osprey coming out of the water with a fish, right? Um, actually, like there's probably hundreds of photos of ospreys, but it's just an example that we've seen a lot in BirdLife Australia Photography Awards. But if you like, when we're coming to unique perspectives. And we're trying to find something that no one has ever found. That's uh, because we know it exists. We've seen it. We've seen it in books. We've seen it in nature docos. But we want to try to get it ourselves, right? So when it comes to that, there's ways of getting it, and there's other ways of getting it. And when we come into the ways of getting it, is uh, these are the, the the most the most common ones that we use. Uh, in in the world of wildlife photography, which is using camouflage and hides, using remote cameras and remote triggers, using drones and using different lenses. Uh, let's talk a little bit about about all of these ones. So using camouflage and hides is what I usually recommend to everybody doing bird photography, because you set you you put yourself in the environment and you at you create a distance between you as a human and you as part of the environment to the bird that you're photographing or to the animal you're photographing. So the big difference between camouflage and hides is that camouflage is usually worn, worn by the user for concealment and the hides can be an aquatic or terrestrial structure. It's key when you're talking about both of those as well that you understand that the best even the best way like of using those 
is to understand that the habitat doesn't move towards the subject, the subject moves towards the habitat. So it will it will help you in, in the fact of getting the animal to move closer to you and also getting you to get a better shot without putting too much stress on the bird and also remaining hitting, hidden and lessening the interaction between you and the animal. I strongly recommend both, and both of these are great solutions if you're trying to photograph something that is unapproachable or something that is really skittish. In general, it's usually usually really better to like usually best to have both of these in your quiver so you can use them at any point. Um, and it also helps you uh, get better, like get unobstructed, unobstructed behavior from wildlife. So it'll give you the chance of of being there and observing something without the animal actually being shy or being skittish because you're there. So basically this just increases your success rate when getting the photo as well. Um, when, when we talk about setting up hides and camouflage, it's a, it's a good thing to understand that this is also when your field reconnaissance and your pre-production comes into, uh, into fruition, where you got to think about things that uh, will affect your shot, right? When is the animal most active? And feel like the field reconnaissance if it is well where are you going to set up the hide where is the animal doing it's if like where where is the animal doing what you want to photograph and on top of that also you gotta you gotta understand how you're going to be avoiding how to be seen or heard as well and this is where where i stress uh, a lot as well when it depending on what you're photograph or photographing is that you by minimizing your impact in wildlife, you're going to get a better shot as well, but you're going to be preserving the animal's wildlife. So um, whenever I'm setting up a hide or a camouflage, I always say set up before the animal is awake, be silent, blend, in, blend into surroundings, stay downwind, uh, downwind and smell, don't, don't put like something that will make the animal smell you. And above all, try to stay still as much as you can. So don't move if you're in a hide or in a camouflage. Sometimes, depending on what species you're photographing, it will like, like it'll be easily triggered by how you're moving if you're really close as well. well. Then I think the most patient thing when whatever like sorry the most like important thing whenever you're doing uh, camouflage photography or hide photography is to be patient sometimes some shots can take up to two years depending on what you're trying to do there's a story of a uh guy that was filming for bbc uh one of one of these david attenborough's uh docos i think it was uh seven worlds and one planet and he stayed about two years trying to photograph oh sorry film uh siberian tigers and he didn't get anywhere close to where a guy with a remote camera did. So it's 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 really key to understand that patience is a big thing when it comes to ethical photography as well. Because if you're patient and you allow that space, the animal will naturally do what it's meant to do. And you'll eventually get the shot that you're going for. Uh, um, these are some of my examples when I, when I talk about... Uh, like using hides this is one of my photography project, projects about three years ago where i was uh i spent about four to five months uh photographing satin bower birds and, and i would arrive there usually about three o'clock in the morning to four o'clock in the morning uh around 3 40 some somewhere around there there set up the hide um far away so i wouldn't be obstructing like I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be in the Sentenbauer bird's way, and I had a long lens. I would stick in a place and just stay there as long as I could to not uh, be in the Sentenbauer bird's habitat super vividly. And I would, I would drape the the camouflage like the the hide with all types of leaves. Uh, found in the environment so it could I, I could really blend in 
and like remain completely unseen. And I got some really good like footage and and scenes of of that little guy right there just uh, ripping away all of the adult uh, males blue blue caps. So for those of you that don't know, uh, juvenile satin bowerbirds also sometimes try and take advantage of uh, adult male satin bowerbirds uh, bowers. And one of the th key things that I observed for a really long time was just this guy messing around and trying to do some sabotage on on that guy's bower. Um, this is a this is another project that I was working on, but four years four years to five years back where I was photographing kangaroos. Uh, this was also using camouflage. Sorry, this was using camouflage. The other one was was hide where um, I was wearing a ghillie suit and I was tracking a family of kangaroos for about uh, let's say six months and trying to photograph their daily behaviors. This is what was a juvenile female that uh, I was uh, like always caught my eye and she would always like know so, uh, that there was something wrong in the habitat and look straight at the lens as well. So, I, I mean, it was really cool in the way where I, like I was still a little bit noticeable and I think that caught her eye, but it was, it was really cool to remain undetected and get and like and see the the natural interaction from these kangaroos as well. Um, moving forward, let's talk about a little bit more about using uh, remote cameras and remote triggers, right? It's a big thing where uh, bird life photography also talks a lot about this, where remote triggers are really, really, really good when it comes to trying to get a shot where you're still keeping that distance away. This is still a form of ethical photography uh, and where you're not jeopardizing the animal, right? Um, when it comes to remote cameras, we always talk about how uh, how this works, right? So with remote cameras, there's different ways that you can set a remote camera and like you can either do a motion sensor camera trap or you can also do drones. With bird photography, never do drones. It's one It's one of the requirements of the CASA uh, flight registration that you do uh, the, uh, before you actually can fly a drone. You, you cannot fly near birds. Nevertheless, depending on what type of photography you are doing, it is essential to what you do. So although it is not good for, for when you're doing bird, bird photography, depending on what project you are doing, if you are a trained professional, drones are absolutely acceptable. And I hammer on top of this because drones can be uh, like used ethically. It just depends on how you use it and like in, in which situation as well. Um, always fly with, with permits, always fly within uh, legal terms, always fly where you are not jeopardizing any animal. And a big thing as well is that motion 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 uh, sensored camera traps are absolutely fine um, as long as you're not using a really bright flash and putting like nocturnal animals into into danger. You're that's that's OK. Uh, the main thing when it comes to flash is that you don't want to be flashing a super bright light in a nocturnal animal's face where that's causing them to be temporarily blind so a uh, big thing in bird life and ethical photography that we talk about is not using flash for, for nocturnal animals also when it comes to remote triggers it's a big thing where sometimes if you can get a shot where you leave the camera there and walk away and the the animal walks right in front of the camera and you take that shot from a long distance you're still being ethical you're still keeping that distance from the animal and you're still doing a good shot in fact, you're doing really good in the fact that you're keeping your distance away from the animal and you're getting a different perspective as well. So all of these three is, is a good way for you to keep a distance away, uh, capture a unique perspective without you being there. And also this captures all of these unique possibilities where you are taking photos maybe from different angles that nobody has ever seen before. Um, so whenever we talk about setting up remote triggers and cameras, we gotta 
we also got to go back to that pre-production and we got to think, think about how and when we're, we're going to photograph this, right? So we got to think about when the animal is more like the most active, when we have a guarantee of a successful shot and how like this goes into what we've studied as well. So in saying this, this is also, it comes into, it comes into play where uh, you're also going to be preserving your camera gear. And that's a big thing as well, because if you, if you can't guarantee a successful shot and you don't know when the animal is more, the most active and you don't know where the animal is going to exhibit that behavior, you can just leave your camera out there for like three or four days and it can get rained on and eventually you're going to like, you're going to lose your camera. So it's, it's a big thing where you got to like, you got to weigh everything up and figure out what's the best way to go to it as well. And this is going to basically be what I call a camera routine. Um, with camera routines, it's also like where, because whenever you do in remote, remote photography, uh, and setting up a drone, you're setting up, uh, you're setting up a remote camera, you're setting up a remote trigger where you're triggering from far away. You're never going to get the shot at the first time you may, and that's going to be really, really lucky. Um, but sometimes you can take up to like 50 tries also again, um, when implementing a camera routine. But also it's understanding that if you keep going to the same place and you keep referring back to what you've studied already and you keep putting the camera in the same place and going for the same thing and trying to photograph the same uh, same behavior you saw, you've seen happen in the same place, you're eventually going to get where you're going for. So I, whenever I talk about implementing camera routines, it's a big thing where uh, if you're photographing nocturnal animals, I always talk about acquainting animals with LEDs. So LEDs are very, very different to flash uh, photography, where if you have an LED in an environment and the animal keeps coming to that environment on a regular basis and gets acquainted with the LED, eventually you'll get a, a shot with the LED that you're not putting the animal's eyes in danger but you're also creating the light that you need to take the photo. So, but this is also done through a long period of time. It's something that sometimes you have to be two or three months out there and you'll see the BBC guys doing this as well, where they put LEDs out there and they will basically just implement that as long as possible. So the animals can get used to the LEDs. And so the LEDs can work for the cameras as well as to get the shot that they're going for. Um, this is, uh, I also say acquainting animals with shutter bursts because in some older cameras, uh, shutter bursts are really loud. So it's a thing where the, you got to also think about how the camera implements into uh, getting that shot and how the animal is going to interact with that shutter burst. Some, some shutter bursts, like the 1DX uh, camera, which some of you might use, is as you know very 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 loud and it'll like the rattle just thrrr, it sounds like a machine gun so depending on what animal is interacting with with that they'll scare really easily uh so it's it's also finding the right balance between acquainting an animal and also finding the right shutter burst that won't scare them away it's also Planning ahead for weather, that's a big thing when it, when it comes to implementing a camera routine. So if you don't have a, a Pelican case where it's weather sealed and you can leave the, the camera there for ages, you also got to plan ahead for the weather. It's also attaching the gear securely. So depending on what you're going to photograph, um, you also got to think about securing things safely because otherwise something can carry off your gear. And I think the main thing is knowing when to be flexible. When with camera routines, it's easy for you to get stuck in one routine and not change, not be flexible. Um, being flexible means knowing when to change the camera angle, knowing when to call it quits or when to come back and stuff like that. So it's important to have all these, th these things in mind when you're doing a camera routine. Uh, and when, when I talk about re camera routines, I think the main thing that I always talk about, repetition is key. The more you try, the more the more chances it is uh, you're likely to get the shot that you're going for. 
and the more the more patient you are with the repetition that you're doing like you understand how the, the system works eventually you'll get the shot as well patience is the biggest key as well, the biggest like secret to finding that perfect shot and getting that balance between uh not interacting with the the environment and finding the perfect moment to do so um, so these are these are some some of my shots where I've used uh, like these methods. Uh, this was last year as well. This was a project that I was working with James Cook University, um, and we were out in, close to St George in Queensland, and I had I saw I saw this power I saw this great power bird, and I just knew I, I needed the. I needed to get a little bit of that shot. So I would set up the camera. Um, I, I, I set up the camera and I camouflaged it. I put a, like, this is early in the morning, put a uh, motion sensor, also camouflaged that. And as soon as he would land, it, the camera would take about 15 shots every, in an interval, every, uh, like for for two minutes or something like that until uh, it would fill up the SD card. I would like go look at it in the morning, go look at it at night. And then eventually after five days, I got the shot that I was going for. Um, but it's a big thing where you gotta understand that repetition is key, but also uh, understanding when to be flexible and that some shots like this may take up to five to six days or something like that. It may be easier like this, like a day shot sometimes is easier where you don't need light, but it's just understanding how how your camera works and how the how to be ethical about it as well and i think this is this is very well suited for backyard birds um like most of you guys will probably have one of these in your backyard and uh this was a project that i was working about also four to five years ago where i wanted to get some oh no sorry three years ago um, where I wanted to get, I was doing urban animals, and one of the key animals in Sydney is like uh, sulfur-crested co cockatoos. So it's really, it's really cool. Where I wanted to get a shot, and I knew that uh, I didn't want to be intrusive about it as well. So I wanted to give the cockatoo space and not feel like I was right in their face. So I left my camera out there, went went away, and then basically had the trigger in my hand as soon as the cockatoo walked where I wanted to, just took the photo. And I wanted I wanted to get that that shot of it like walking across the fence, like it owned the fence. And as you know, most of sulfur cockatoo sulfur crested cockatoos in Australia pretend they they own the place. <laughs> Which they can. You know, it's uh it's a big bird. So most important of all, when it comes to remote photography, I want to I want to stress on drone capturing and how and when to use them. And the first thing I always talk about whenever like how to use a drone is never jeopardize an animal's health, right? So if you know if you know that just the noise of the drone is going to be annoying to the animal, never put it out there. And again, uh, these these are my guidelines that I put to anybody that is doing drone photography which is always try to keep 20 meters away from any animal so that's that's basically standard casa rules uh so casa rules here in australia dictate that you should be 30 minutes away oh, sorry 30 meters away from any person or living thing um 20 meters is is basically what's like it got lowered a little bit. Um, it's it varies depending on like if you have a permit or not. Uh, if you have if you have a biologist with you, uh, they will usually say twenty meters away. Uh, but just keep that in mind when you're whenever you're you're and notice the animal's behavior as well. A big thing right there as well that I always stress when it comes to drone photography is do not use a drone if there is birds flying around in the same heights and if you are photographing birds do not photograph birds with drones like usually people that do that 
will either do that with an ultralight plane or with a helicopter, which is a way bigger thing than a drone. Drones are like, if you if you look at the accidents that have happened in Sydney, uh, and I work with wires as well. I I work with wires as a as a wild wildlife rescuer. Uh, if you look at the accidents which happens to to uh, birds of prey, a lot of them happen because of drones. So it's it's key to understand that if there are animals like even birds nesting in the area, don't use a drone. Um, yes, uh, look, have a look at fly zones. Have a look if you have permission to fly. And also, above all, make sure that all your drone rules are being followed. So don't break drone rules to get the shot. And remember that all like uh, above all, remembers that remember that animals also get anxious and stressed, and that animals can get like the anxiety and stress stress in animals can cause death. Um, so this is one of my shots uh, about three years back as well, working with uh, dingoes uh, here in New South Wales. It was uh, it was an absolute pleasure where I had the opportunity to track them across the wild, uh, like a wild habitat for about a year. And this is one of the shots that I wanted to, to, to have of, well, I mean, dingoes usually walk around 60 kilometers every day. So it's really cool to get that big shot in perspective, how big their habitat can be. So there's a little, there's a little dingo right there. Um, this is Lucy, one of the alpha females, the, the alpha female of the pack that I was following, uh, walking across the landscape. And this, this is just a shot of how big her patrol was early in the morning that I wanted to get. Um, all right. And then moving forward to a completely, completely different bit, which is using these techniques to capture the essence. And when I talk about the essence, it's funny the the grain in your story that hits the hits the, the observer and it's key to understand that if your photo has essence that's when your photo is like messes with the person's or the observer's feeling as well so I, I always say if think about like think about the shot that you're developing like we've talked about the problem in, in pre-producing right when it comes to your mind and that's kind of like, oh, I want to get the photo of, a, of an egret in flight with, uh, like, I just want to show an egret in flight with a, with a fish in its mouth. And how can you, how can you make that photo connect to the reader, right? And then you gotta, you gotta think about how that, like, how you can put that into perspective even more. You can freeze the shot absolutely with a, with a fast shot, but you can take it a step further. You can make it you can make it more artistic if you want to and like this is in in that case it's like talking about uh egrets uh with a fish in its mouth flying across uh a landscape i'd say go for a pen so you, you get that movement you get like everything everything in the background a little bit blurred but you're also getting that shot of the, the egret flying through with like with the catch so it's pretty cool in that way uh, but, but again, it's it's putting all of that into perspective, creating an essence, but also respecting how you're doing it as well. So when I, this is this is one of my um, projects that I was working on recently as well, where there's a lot of roadside collisions in well across Australia as well. It's not just New South Wales, but New South Wales is a lot of roadside collisions with wildlife, and it's one of the biggest factors when it comes to uh, just deaths in wildlife, really. And it's a big thing where it's not talked about enough. But again, we like, as wildlife photographers, we create like these perspectives um, and put them out there so people can create like an awareness of what's happening. So in this shot right here, I was using a drone to get that up, like that perspective from up, up above to to change the perspective of the viewer, but also using the techniques of long exposures. So you can see the car is going, but everything else is frozen. So because everything else is static, I can do that uh, movement with the car just by getting that shutter a little bit delayed. So 
moving forward on top of that, we've got approaching your subject as well. So once we've talked about like creating those those solutions right there, another part of the the, the solution uh, when it comes to we're, we're we're talking about how these solutions work, but a big thing how these solutions work is understanding how you approach your subject because uh, sometimes it's it's key to understand that uh, some shots you can get by approaching your subject, but you also got to do that in an ethical way. So I always talk about when it's when you're approaching your your subject, you got to understand that animals also have feelings. You know that animals also feel things; they get scared. And above all, a lot of the animals live in a world where. Uh, they are part of a food chain, unless you're sitting on top, like very, very, very on top, like a wedged tail eagle, where the only thing that will kill it realistically as an adult is us. Uh, other animals, other birds, they sit below that. So our rule of thumb is basically that these and like the rule of thumb is basically never jeopardize an animal's health. But it's key to understand that if all of these animals are sitting down below we are also on the top of the food chain and we can also cause an effect on top of these animals so when it talks about that i want like talking about that it's it's key to understand the, to always let the animal approach you instead of you approaching it so that's a big thing where we we in bird life uh photography awards we'll see some some descriptions like I've approached this animal and this animal flew away. I approached it again and then it flew away. That's the animal fleeing away from me. But sometimes if the animal is trusting you, whether it be it be like if it's flown in and it's giving you that vote of confidence, then you're okay. Um, as long as you're not seeking and chasing after it and or attracting it through methods that are not okay. Uh, basically think about that when you're approaching your subject as well and then it, it's key to understand how your approach is going to work because depending on how your approach is going to work you're also understand that depending on what you're doing you're also at risk so i always talk about whenever you're approaching an animal or an animal actually approaches you for the first time look at the signs right so look at the body language um, see if you're not a present danger to the animal or 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 the animal is a present danger to you and that if that you will not that the the animal will not suffer ecologically from the act interaction that you're doing a big thing when it comes to uh the body language like demonstrates openness and like how the body language is going to go in in a bird or anything look at like cassowaries for example right there's a lot of stories of people up in Eddie Bay uh, getting too close to a cassowary, and a cassowary has a chick, and it's mad. It's going to kick the tourist, obviously. It's also it's also key to understand that, like, if you're getting that close, it might be a danger to you, but it's also, like, it's also a, a potential danger for the animal because, like, if you're looking at other animals that exist in the Australian ecosystem. If a dingo attacks a human, usually that dingo gets targeted by by the government, the local government, and gets put down sometimes because of that. But not necessarily dingo's fault. We got too close first. Also, it's like on top of that, uh, whenever approaching an animal or an animal approaching you, when I, when I say it will not suffer ecologically from interactions. If you are feeding a bird and you're in, like feeding a bird over time, that bird starts to unattach from that uh, foraging behavior that it originally has. Instead of that, it will always seek you and not seek the wild. So it will that ecological uh, interaction between it and nature will be broken because of an like an interaction that you have with the animal as well. So. Like it's a big thing as well when you when you're analyzing all of that that different species should also be interacted with different methods. Like you don't like let's let's say for example you won't interact the same way that you're interacting with the cassowary the same way you interact with the possum. Um, just different different animals and different like scales as well. 
this is important because it, it avoids triggering your attacks, giving animals stress, and also makes it, making making uh, animals flee. And then I think a big thing when it comes to that is that this gives you more chance of getting a good shot by respecting that boundary as well. Um, and then also on top of all of that, putting that in little parentheses, producing is also getting all of that in a little niche, but using light to paint uh, to paint a picture on top of that as well. So it's finding that extra bit in the narrative where you can pull in the perspective with things that you see on a daily day day to day basis, but you can you can put that in an emotional way into the picture. Um, so the way I always talk about this, uh, especially when it comes to photography, is that depending on what you put, like what type of lighting you put into the picture, it can have different feelings. Um, so it goes into how you can hit to, to the animal's presence, be there, generate happiness, like any any like any mood that you feel, or when you're looking uh, through the viewfinder, you can emote that through a like a through the light that you're putting or you're representing into the photo so uh for uh, these are just some examples that uh i've used over over the years uh when it when it specifically when talking to that uh talking about that so if you want to give a little bit of like a curious look and give it a little bit of like of a mysterious look what i like to do is give it a little bit of split lighting where you divide uh the subject and a little bit of like half of like half in the light half in the shadow like as you can see this uh black shouldered kite has half its face in the in the shadow and half in the light which gives it a little bit of a, a mysterious look i'd say or you can completely isolate uh the subject from the from the background and just get get that spotlighting effect on the animal and then just have everything on on um in the shadows this, you can do this naturally depending on how you do it as well so again i don't support the use uh, use of flashes and like with wildlife but this is this is just an example of of how you can do it this is one of my photos i did it naturally with some sun, sunlight um you just got to be there at the right time in the right place and one of my favorites that i've been doing a lot lately is just backlighting so getting that uh finding the perfect light coming from from behind uh the animal where you're using that silhouette and just hinting to the animal's presence without you actually seeing it there and putting once you put that all together it starts to create a narrative so through one image you can tell a story and that's i think the most important thing when producing it right there because you've created the solution but you want to also tell you want to create a narrative and you want to like the the solution should be the the narrative that you're trying to create okay moving on this is this is the final bit when it comes to post-production where we're looking at the the last bit of your of, of the process um i always talk about this because it's also a big thing where Ethical photography is also in the way you edit the photo. Um, so looking looking back, um, some a big thing when it comes to like some photos that we see sometimes in in like in like competition like the competition like a bird life is where some of the photos will be completely like uh, changed. Uh, and the lights won't be the same. Uh, Yes, that is like maybe a, a market train, like uh, like like a market tent at the moment, uh, to oversaturate colors and make them pop. So when you look at it, it's kind of like whoa, these colors are so vibrant. But at the same time, you're not representing the true beauty of nature. So you start to create this appetite for these photos that are not necessarily actually representing what you actually see um so this is this is also a big part where ethical photography goes in the way you were presented in the in the aftermath so whenever it comes to post-producing i always talk about this there's, there's 
three things that come into effect, which is editing nature, uh, sorry, editing mirror uh, the photos to, to actually reflect what you're seeing and what actually nature is, uh, developing that narrative to actually be what you've seen and to not spread like bad information and also sharing co content in like the right channels in the right way, right? So when I when I talk about when I talk about uh, editing photos to mirror nature's beauty, it's um, straightforward in the fact where uh, the things that you do, like they should they should move forward in a in a, an organized way, right? like that the viewer also gets the right representation. And a big thing when it comes to uh, like all of that is just having your colors right. So I'll just give you a, like a, some tips when it comes to editing photos, right? So uh, I always talk, I'll always talk about color correcting, color grading, and basic adjustments, right? So color correcting is basically when you're out, out in nature and it's a really cloudy day and you take a photo and it's like really orangey. Uh, yes, that happens sometimes, but you you can you can fix that. Uh, usually you can you can do that inside of the camera. Uh, cameras have a white balance function that usually a lot of people starting off will use it in automatic, but you can choose a specific white balance for the 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 scene that you're shooting in. So sometimes there's presets like you can put it on cloudy, you can put it in the shadow, you can put it in different uh in different like presets if you want to or you can completely change it and put it in a color temperature tone so like kelvin for example like 5300 5200 something like that um i recommend it to always do it in body if you can but if you can't you can always do it in post processing as well so whenever i talk about uh so color correcting refers to uh correcting the white points of the image so making it the white uh making the white the true white so when you look at it, the white it's not orangey white it's not grayish white this is white right so uh you just ba like by doing that it just corrects the tone of the image and, and uh by doing that whenever you look into the photo you're getting what you actually see through your naked eye. So uh, if, if you use Lightroom, this is this is the easiest way to do it. And I, I tell everybody this, that you just get the color picker, you, f you select the white point of the image um, for this image right here that I have a, a great crested grape. It's just the neck, that's the truest white in the image. So that's the closest to the white. Uh, here's here's the difference where you can see the diff uh, between a not color corrected and a color corrected. So color corrected is right there green check mark and not color corrected is right there X mark. Uh, there's a few other adjustments, but you can see there's a big difference between what actually is and what actually isn't, because one is what the camera trying to pick up its own its own thing. And this and the other one is actually fixing it right there. Um, and what another thing as well is color grading. Color grading is a, a thing that has become a a recent sensation where people change the colors slightly so they match a color tone. I'm oh, sorry, color rule. So when we talk about color grading, uh, there's there's a few color gradings uh, like rules. So basic color grading rules uh, are just going to pop right here at the bottom for you, and you can have a look at those. Uh, and I'll explain those in a bit as well. So uh, these are based on Newton's uh, light experimentations with the prism, where there was the the color wheel, right, and Everything in nature follows a color, a, a color rules. And this is basic color theory when it comes to artistic, uh, like artistic theory, um, where you would paint a picture or you would paint things with uh, a color rule. Uh, when it, come, it comes to that, if you look 
on your left right here, left bottom left, where it says complementary. That is colors from one side mirroring the colors from the other. So, for example, if you look at a dingo on the dunes, you'll have like orange on the dingo, you'll have blue in the sky and maybe a little bit of orange on the sand as well in early morning. And that is a complementary color right there. Or you can have uh, monochromatic where you, where you have all of the shades of one color, or you can have a uh, triadic, for example, in a, like a rainbow or a key, where you have four colors uh, or three colors being in one image. Um, so blue, green, actually rainbow or keys have like all the colors. So it would be it would be a uh, it'd be a mix, right? But color grading has become a sensation where sometimes uh, color grading will be used on the image too much and it won't actually represent wildlife like what you're actually seeing. I do recommend the, the use of color grading and color grading is a really good way for for the viewer to be able to see what you actually see with your own eye, but in used in moderation. So easiest way to do color grading as well when I want to talk about color grading is uh, if you use Lightroom again, just do the color wheels right there. Um, there, there is a bit where you can color grade as much as you can, and you can you can get the effect that you're going for. Uh, so here's two examples of color grading and how it, I believe it should be used. Uh, how a lot of people use it uh, on the professional side of things, where uh, if you look right here on on the left, you'll have not color graded. On the on the right, you'll have color graded. So very slightly, but one just seems a little bit more appeasing to look at. Um, still represents the true the true color of nature, and you're still looking at like a very good image, in like through your your pers like the perspective. It's not overblown. It's not like massively edited. It's just small adjustments, so you can get uh, so it can be a little bit more melodious to your eye when when you're looking through. Like there's a bit more of of harmony. Um, also developing a narrative. So the image doesn't necessarily go by itself, uh, where you just put the image up and you just leave it floating there. Most of the images have a story to tell. And when and I've seen that basically everybody that photographs, when they are sharing the photos, they share at least one or two words. I think the big thing when it comes to developing a narrative is also developing that narrative so it creates awareness on what you're trying to photograph and also what you wanted to create awareness for. So I think it's all, a big thing when it comes to developing a narrative is putting it into perspective what you want to share. So I always put that into, into your mind of like, how am I going to talk about this and talking about it in the right way so people captivate it in the right way as well. So that that brings us to the last bit right there where uh, we're talking about sharing content as well. And it's really important to share content because that's how you start to create awareness on things that you are photographing. And I think a big thing is that once you start creating problems in the first bit when you're doing pre-production and solving problems after, you start to create narratives and these narratives could be very powerful to create awareness and conservation issues. So a lot of people that start working this way sometimes start finding things in, in nature that are are really, really interesting and it gets shared in a really powerful way. So I, I always talk about um, there's different ways of sharing content and uh, a big thing that I always encourage everyone that photographs birds, go join bird, bird life photography. They're a really good platform to do that. They and you know you get a heaps of benefits. You you get to meet heaps of people. And I think a big thing is just, just the share that love of uh, photographing birds is is amazing. So when you think about all of that, I think uh, like it's it's a big process and it's a uh, it's a beautiful process as well. I'm just gonna finish with this quick quote from Elspeth Huxley, which is one of my favorite. Uh, authors she she wrote a few books uh covering the life of and, and the work 
of Hugo Van Lawick, which was one of the fathers of wildlife photography for National Geographic. And um, she writes in one of her books and she says, the wildlife photographers of today are much more than entertainers. They are the chroniclers of the natural world who preserve on a film a record of its riches and diversity. And I just want to leave that with you today because that is basically, if you are a photographer, you're not just there doing like a little bit of fun. You are there as a chronicler of the natural world and you are preserving on a film, a record of its riches and diversity. And you have the responsibility of not only showing that record, but also keeping it and preserving it as much as you can. Um, that's about it for me, but I encourage you to reach out with to me for any questions that you have, um, either online or offline as well. And I'll pass it back to Annie. Thank you so Thank much. You. Ooh, um, everyone there. Um, thank you so much for hanging around, Luca. Uh, keep your camera going, and if you're happy to hang around, there's been a few questions come up in the chat that we can go through. Um, for sure. A few technical ones, but first, Yana actually raised the point regarding ethical photography of things like taking photos near nests and using um, callbacks. Uh, for people who might not be familiar with why that can be a bit of a murky thing to do, could you just quickly touch on that? Absolutely, absolutely. This is that's a big thing. That's a very big thing. I I I should have touched that on a little bit earlier as well. Um, so there's so it was callbacks first, right? And then nest. Okay. Uh, callbacks just so, not necessarily at nest, but anywhere. Yeah. So callback, callback is basically uh, an idea that started originating first with the idea of pishing. So those of you that are birders for a long time or have been in birding groups for a really long time uh, have have maybe heard of the idea of pishing. And pishing is this this idea that originated from one of these birders um, in somewhere that if you go. Psh, 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 um, it it's, sounds like a bird, a small bird is like a chick is in distress and that'll attract other birds to come and see what it is. So that's where it originated first. And it was, it was really attractive to the pe people that started doing it first because you would see birds descend from the canopies down, down at the bottom and you'd be like, whoa, I've never seen that bird before, but I just saw it now. So on top of that as well, uh, that started, that started propagating a lot because a lot of people were kind of like, oh, that's really cool. I've, I'm seeing birds that nobody has ever seen. And this, this this idea of going on a bird year and finding as many birds as you can and getting as many birds as you can in a bird scene list uh, went viral to the point that people started finding new ways to, uh, to look at birds. And... One of the really one of the really interesting things is that someone found out uh, while looking at birds is that uh, there's the next step to fishing is that if you imitate the bird, the bird will come and see you. So uh, a lot of people that knew how to whistle started trying to whistle to the bird to see the, the birds come closer and it started working. Uh, the modern thing, though, is that people have uh merlin and other apps have developed like have developed this database of bird sounds where you can uh see and hear every bird that exists in nature but depending on how you play it or how like when you play it as soon as you play it it's so identical and it is identical to what the bird actually is because these are pro recordings from ornithologists and citizen scientists they're dedicated to this database that it will be the exact bird making the same call and it will attract the bird so a few years back callbacks got really 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 uh like sought out after by people that were doing bird photography just because it would attract literally any bird that you wanted to ride in front of your lens so that's the basic that's the basic where uh, that is what callback is. But the thing that 
a lot of people did not know when they started doing callback is that callback actually stresses out birds because if, if you're playing that noise over and 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 over again until you get that shot it's the same thing as like me going over to any of you and be hey 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 look at me look at me look at me look at me you know so in a lot of ways it puts stress and there's uh there's been a lot of studies there's been a lot of studies that have shown that uh callback actually is not good for 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 wildlife because it puts it puts the animal in in like it puts the like the animal under extreme stress it's it's gone to cases where where callbacks have actually uh killed some birds so um a big thing when it comes to ethical photography and i i think it goes without saying is that callback at bird life photography we do not accept it at all and we really hammer on top of the fact that uh, if you if you want to photograph a good bird, don't don't use callback, just because it puts a lot of stress under a bird. Um, and although some ornithologists would would use it for scientific pur purposes, they do it under very like strict guidelines. So it's not something that they can go around just doing it. And I would like I, although it is open for the public to do it, I strongly encourage all of you never do it. And then nest photography, um, yeah, just don't do it. <laughs> the 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 idea originated also a really long time ago at like these uh like God God the 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 godfathers of of wildlife photography that started taking photos of of nests and got really famous for it because it's a representation of nature. It is a representation representation of nature. But at the same time, depending on how you do it, it puts a lot of stress on, on under the parents and the chicks. So uh, if you if you like, we don't support it, and none of the the photography competitions around the, the world actually support it. You'll you'll have very few that do, um, and the main reason for that is just because there is too much stress going on, like on breeding populations. So it's just keeping that uh, distance away as much as you can. Mm -hmm. They are really, really important things to be mindful of. So let's do a couple of probably less complex technical questions. Um, what kind of gear do you recommend for beginners who might not have anything and they're just getting started? Okay. Uh, the I, I would say stick to Canon or Nikon or Sony. So those are the three I would recommend. Uh, in... I would recommend Nikon and Canon above all. Mm -hmm. If you're going to Canon, I would say uh, nowadays an R7 body or uh, an R7 would probably be the best camera in the Canon on, on a beginner range um, paired with an 100 to 400 um, mil. Or on the Nikon side, I would say a Z50 with they well they're coming out with some new lenses so it depends on your budget nikon has a few different lenses that canon doesn't have um but yeah z50 i'd say um and then if you can i would say at any point in one of those two try to aim for a 150 or a 180 to 600. i can see everyone yeah. frantically noting that down as you say it um and where do you store your photos would you recommend the cloud or something mm -hmm. else uh so i i i always recommend it have it in two places if you can i'm a bit dodgy when it comes to that and i know i'm wrong <laughs> i keep it in one place only and i have like i have hard drives so um i have physical hard drives that are plugged into the computer um they're eight terabytes so they're also like powered into the wall um they're socket powered so they're a bit more fail safe but they are really 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 good um that's usually my physical storage that is great to know now what about how are you adjusting for light changes with remote sensor adjusting for light changes with the motion sensor yeah can you adjust for that as it happens or is it something you correct for later you, you can um so i have for that routine that i'm doing I will always have 
uh, the sensor is it's an infrared sensor. So basically anything that triggers the infrared uh, will so it's like an like it's kind of imagine there's this uh, so if you, like most of you have seen at least one spy movie where there's a laser as soon as the, someone crosses that laser at like something fires at, at, at the spy right or like the alarm goes off so the way my my there's there's a few options in, in the system like in, in the in the market but the way i've opted for is there's an infrared uh, infrared uh trigger that, that goes from one side to the other and as soon as that infrared line is crossed it, like it like uh the the camera will burst and take the photo um for so basically, I don't have to adjust for that. That's that goes as long as as, as that's set up. But for light, I will adjust it for the specific time of day that I'm trying to, to to get the shot. So if I'm leaving it out for the whole day, I will only aim for the golden light hours. Oh, this is very organized. This is very plan ahead. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and. Uh... Deb's wondering, do you always pre-format your cards? Now, I, I don't know which cards she means, but maybe you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I get the question. I do. So as soon as I transfer the photos into, into Lightroom and before I go into the in, into the wild, I will always have them formatted. Like, if there's photos onto the card, I've missed a step in my, in my pre, like pre-production system. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll only do a couple of more questions because we're already over time. But yeah. Michael, right. is how effective do you really stand by camo versus regular clothes? I think I might know the answer. Based on Sorry, what was the question? Like wearing camouflage clothes versus just wearing standard streetwear. Um, it depends on the project. If I'm working on a photojournalist project, or if I'm if I'm working with mammals and biologists, I won't be in camouflage. <laughs> uh, but I do prefer camouflage over, over streetwear. Okay, that's good to know. Now, I'm going to close with one last question, and it's a little bit of a doozy. So yeah. your challenge, Luca, is trying to make it as short as possible. So Susan wonders whether you see AI as an opportunity and whether it's ethical. How can human photographers identify their work to safeguard the art? But your challenge is to make it a quick answer. Well, I'm... Very quick answer is AI sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's not real. Um, like AI is real. It can like it, it can put work out there, but at the same time, uh, AI doesn't actually represent what you actually see in the wild. It's computer generated. It's not. It's not scientist uh, approved. So it's a different conversation that we'd be having here if we were interested in AI. I imagine. Right. I'm gonna yeah. end the session there, but thank you so much your time it's been really wonderful to learn so much such a broad topic to condense into this uh, for everyone in the audience we're going to record this session it has been recorded and we'll pop it up on youtube and everyone who's attended tonight will get a link to that um and that's the same channel that we have all of our other birds meet sessions in but yeah once again thank you so much luca and i hope everyone has a nice night and good luck with your bird photography everyone see you all thanks for having me guys thank you